Hello and welcome to Cherwell TV. Today, as you can see, we're at St Anthony's College for a visiting parliamentary fellowship seminar titled Traditional Parties and the Populist Challenge. We'll be speaking to one of the panellists, Lord Hennessy, about the challenges Britain faces in the modern world. Lord Hennessy, thank you so much for speaking to us today at Cherwell Broadcasting. Could you perhaps discuss a bit more about the title of the event today, so traditional parties and the populist movement. What does that actually mean to you in 2017? Well, I'm not sure there is a populist movement, but there's populism about swirling around. I suppose what I'm going to think about is whether the standard model of British politics in my lifetime is breaking down. Now, what do I mean by the standard model? Well, I've been breathing in every general election since 1950. I was born in 1947. And the standard model, as I've conceived it in the British context, is this. Elections are a tussle between two things. Liberal capitalism, which I regard as the best engine mankind has yet produced for innovation and economic growth, and social democracy, which I think is the best instrument mankind has yet developed for sensible and equitable redistribution. And sometimes the British electorate has voted for a serious squirt of one rather than the other. Most of the time they want a fusion of the two. And the job of Westminster and Whitehall, though they don't always articulate it like this, in fact they don't articulate it like this, is to make, pick out the best of each and fuse them. Could it be that under the pressure of Brexit and the multiple uncertainties we're facing, more dials being reset in our country than at any time since 1945, that we're going to see an end to the standard models? And will there be room for populist elements to squeak in? Some people would say UKIP is populist, and of course there are populist elements, very strong ones in UKIP actually. But populism has always been a part of British political exchange and conversation. But the trouble is with populism, it thinks and acts in primary colours. It simplifies and it defines itself against groups of people and certain states of mind, which give it a kind of bitter edge. Yes, yeah, so you talk about the standard model you know, throughout British political history. Do you think there's been any changing points apart from Brexit that have sort of stimulated new interest in politics, new divergence in parties throughout the last 50 years you've been working in politics? Well, it's, it's, the, it's the wars, really. The two big wars, total wars, were the great shakers-uppers, as you expect, would expect them to be. But in peacetime, the Brexit world in which we're trying to make sense of everything is the fourth big geopolitical shift since 1945. The first one is... Um, disposing of the British Empire. The second one was what the economist rather wittily the other day called Brentry, trying to get in from 1961 onwards and only succeeding in January 73, getting into the EEC as it then was. The third one is the ending of the Cold War, a big geopolitical shift we shared with the whole world. And this is the fourth. And this fourth one is in many ways most vexing and anxiety-inducing. For students of your age witnessing it unfolding, it's, I think, absolutely fascinating, really. Yeah. Uh, it's fascinating enough for an old husk like me, but you'll have to be, you're the generation who'll have to make it work, whatever it is, when we finally land in a new geopolitical place. And you'll have to make all the adjustments, and I'm sure you'll do it very well. From speaking to politicians, you know, from your work as a historian, as an author, as a broadcaster, have you had a sense from them, sort of the changing nature of politicians and how they react to the public throughout yes, the years? Yes, They're different, and, I, and there's many, many admirable people amongst them. Fascinating people, good people, but they, they don't have the, the same aura and feel and electrical force field around them as that generation that had grown up in the slum and been in the war that I first reported in the mid-'70s. They're also m much more obsessed with image, to the point of absurdity, to the point of self-delusion. Where do you see in the next five, ten years from Brexit, what will Britain look like as a political uh, you know, economy and government? I wish I knew. My great fear, and this is the deep within me, is that we'll lose Scotland on the way. The reason why I'm not pessimistic is that we have in the UK deep, deep wells of civility and tolerance. They're not terribly in evidence at the moment, and they weren't in evidence during the referendum campaign but they're there to be drawn upon, and we're going to have to draw deep on them. We're going to have to raise the level of the national political conversation. We're going to have to stop parodying each other. And we need to polish up, not in a flashy way, but in an instrumental way, the main m means of political exchange, which is chat, conversation. And I think we can do that. I was a Remainer, but we've got to accept the result of the referendum. We really have. But why do I say that? It's very simple. It's perhaps madly simplistic, you might think. 
But the deal at the heart of an open society, a parliamentary democracy, open society like ours, is this. Raise voices, yes. Raise fists, no. And the key to that deal holding is that votes prevail, even though it's technically only advisory. We've got to accept the fact that it came up the way it did and just do it. Not just do it in terms of not trying to get a good deal, of course, but just get on with it. Lord Hennessy, thank you very much. Thank you very much.